uh, another Brisbane boy, so yay Brisbane, I mean yay Perth, yay Brisbane, yay Perth, so uh, all good. Thank you stayers, it's been a long day, but very nice to see you all here at the end of the day, and uh, I'm hoping we'll have uh, a little bit of fun in this talk. So, a programmer's guide to sound. So, actually this talk probably could have had a slightly better title, which is that it might have been better titled uh, Practical Guide to Programming Sound. Because during this talk, we're uh, going to build a synthesizer. And we're going to build a synthesizer from scratch and build it all up uh, as we go. So, a practical guide to programming sound. And the goal of this uh, synthesizer building is that we're not going to just build any old synthesizer. We're going to build a modular synthesizer, the mother of synthesizers. This is kind of any you know, uh, kid in the 80s kind of just dreamt of having one of these in their bedroom with all the blinking lights and the, uh, the components they could put together. And one of the secrets to the modular synthesizer, modular or so named because these modules, the, that there is no complete modular synthesizer that you just go out and buy. More often than not, what you do is you go out and you buy selected modules, and then you create your own modular synthesizer out of these individual parts. And the nice thing about that is it gives an extreme amount of flexibility in the way that these machines can be used. Now, I know what you're thinking, this is so 1970s, and I did I did bring my Keith Emerson uh, leather pants with me, but I'm afraid I tried them on this morning and they didn't fit. So I apologize that you're going to miss out on that experience today. Um, but this is Keith Emerson playing on a Moog modular synthesizer over here. And you can see the patch panel, patch, patch cables kind of hanging out of this modular synthesizer. And that's how he's establishing his sound, is by patching this thing in various configurations to do all the kinds of uh, music or sound generation in this case that he's interested in for these performance. Now, the other thing about this is that although you might think this is a 1970s technology, and of course that was the foundation of where a lot of this equipment became extremely popular, but it's actually been going through a really significant resurgence in recent years. And these synthesizers have become extremely popular again. And the reason why is because they're incredibly tactile. You can get your hands on everything, but they're also very configurable. So they um, become kind of the darling of uh, many sort of uh, successful artists these days, such as Hans Zimmer, for example. And I mean, who wouldn't want this studio, right? That, that sort of, uh, I mean, it's a bit of a fuzzy picture, but that whole row along the back there is one gigantic synthesizer. Um, so I'll take one of those any day. Now Hans Zimmer, of course, is known for, you know, every second soundtrack that comes out. But most recently, of course, he did the reboot of, uh, of Blade Runner and, um, and, of course, taking as uh, his uh, homage to Vangelis for that. It was a fantastic... Everyone seen Blade Runner 2049? Yep, so amazing synthesizer tracks for that. Um, here's Daft Punk, uh, another reboot. So Tron Legacy, and uh, this is the modular synthesizer that Daft Punk used for uh, making uh, parts of that soundtrack. Um, who likes Stranger Things? Of course, like who wouldn't like Stranger Things? So here's Kyle Dixon and uh, Michael Stein. And uh, these are the two guys who've been doing the soundtrack for all three, uh, th what, three aren't we? All three of the Stranger, uh, Stranger Things seasons. Um, again, you can see all the synthesizers in their studio in the background there. Uh, another example, uh, Junkie XL. Um, Junkie XL, again, known for many movies, but pro probably one of his better known sort of heavy synthesizer soundtracks uh, was Deadpool. Now, of course, it's not just scoring composers, so this is Dead Mouse's studio, and along the back there you can see Dead Mouse's rack of uh, synthesizer gear, and it's interesting to note um, that there's actually some fantastic videos of Dead Mouse uh, working in his studio on this thing, and you can actually follow him along, and he's talking through the patching and everything that he's uh, getting up to. So, as I said, today we're going to be building a synthesizer, and we're going to be particularly exploring a style of synthesis uh, called subtractive synthesis. And the sort of, the basic premise of subtractive synthesis is that you start with a sort of raw block of sound, much like uh, a sculptor will start with a block of marble, for example. And then to produce your sound, what you're doing is you're going to start chiseling away at the sound. 
And over time, that chiseling away at the sound is then going to create the sound. So we're going to start with a big sound, and then we're going to chisel away to kind of get at the center of what we're after. And in the sound space, we're chiseling away in uh, both amplitude and frequency. So once you've chiseled away to perfection, well, not quite, as it turns out. So there's some issues with perfection. One of the things, I'm not sure how much you guys know about the statue of David, but he's got completely wonky eyes. Has anybody had a look at his eyes before? Um, and, of course, you know, Mick, he knew what he was doing, right? So did he just get the anatomy wrong? No, not at all. So, in fact, because the statue is so large and because of where the audience was situated to look at it, you couldn't ever really see the two eyes at the same time. So instead of being anatomically correct, he decided to follow the artistic path and really use those two views to directly address the audience in those positions to better tell the story of what's going on. And we'll talk a little bit about that today as we go through, that sometimes you don't want perfection. You want a little bit of imperfection in what you're doing to make everything uh, work out. So, We've got sort of four main categories of bits that we're going to be building today. And the first, and this is kind of our uh, raw sound that I was talking about before. So this is the big blocks of sound. And there's two main categories of that. There's noise, which is a pretty big block, and then there are oscillators. And these oscillators come in a number of uh, shapes. So a sine wave, a square wave, a sawtooth wave, and also a triangle. And we're going to go through and build those today. So then we need a couple of chisels. And our two primary chisels are a filter, which is going to help us chisel out in frequency, and also a gate, which is going to help us chisel out in amplitude. And those are going to be our two primary. It's actually a, a, an envelope and an amp, but we'll just call it an envelope for today. And then finally, we're also, well, not second to last, actually, we're going to have some, some filigree. So another interesting thing about David, actually, is that originally his sling and, and also the, the sort of post that he's leaning up against were gold-leafed. Um, and we're, too, also going to have some filigree in our synthesizer, which we're going to add on the end. So this is kind of like post-processing effects you can think of. And uh, today we'll be looking at a reverb. So then the last thing in our toolkit is that we are going to need to have some way of sort of playing notes on our synthesizer, and that is where the sequencer comes into the picture. Now, as I was saying before, when you take all of those modules and you combine them together, this is actually what you end up, because you're often working with multiple copies of the same module. And so when we're building today, we're also going to be making multiple copies of these modules and integrating them and using them together to produce the sounds that we're interested in. So let's start with the building. And a little drink. Okay, uh, let's escape this. Now, I'm going to have to, I, I, I misjudged the height of this, so I'll just, uh, does anyone know Blackadder? I, f I feel like the Prince Regent here, so uh, I apologize for that. But um, So, we're going to be using um, for our, well, let me actually just start super quick here. So the programming language we're going to be using today is called Extempore. This is a programming language I've been working on for um, quite a few years now, uh, and it was a large uh, part of my PhD. Um, we're not going to focus too much. I might make that a little bigger, too. Is that better? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and you can tell from the syntax that this is going to be lispy. So who in here loves lisp? I thought so. <laughs> okay, all good. It's going to be you know, really slow, and I'm going to explain what I'm doing as I go along. So hopefully uh, you won't have any trouble keeping up with what's going on. Um, extempore actually, though, really isn't a lisp, or at least syntactically it's absolutely a lisp. But semantically, it's actually much closer to a combination actually altogether of a lisp, a C, and a Haskell. 
I mean, have you ever heard of such an unholy trinity as those three? <laughs> so, um, but yes, actually that is uh, the, the core of extempore. Now, one of the interesting things is extempore is designed for kind of real-time high performance use, which makes it quite useful for doing these kind of audio processing tasks and to be able to hot swap this code while it's running so that we can make changes while it's executing. Um, now, the most simple sound that we can make out of the system is actually noise. So let me make a little noise for you here. And we're going to compile this in and hopefully we will, oops, after I connect. And noise, programmer's guide to sound, I'm done. Thank you very much, taking my cue. <laughs> Do you need any more? Now, there are a couple of problems with uh, this noise at the moment. Well, there's, there's one primary problem, is that at the moment this is unipolar. So that random number is between 0 and 1. And really for our sound, we want to be going from between negative 1 and 1. So we might like to make it a, a bipolar. The other thing is, though, uh, remembering that we want to make these modules, so I also want to abstract this out, and we're going to do that with a uh, closure. So let me, let me take this and pop it up here. We're going to call it uh, noise. And it's going to take an amplitude. And then what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take our random, multiply it by 2, and of course, it's bipolar. <laughs> now, we're also going to create our noise here. So this is integrating our module into the synthesizer. And it has its own amplitude, as we just described before. So now we can play back the sound here with this in place. Ah, there is one little issue here. Cheat for the moment. And so now we have our module sitting above. So for those of you who, um, this is a function that returns a function. Now in this case, this isn't particularly, this isn't particularly interesting. In fact, it's completely unnecessarily really because there's no state for this particular module. Okay. But all the rest of our modules we're going to introduce today will have state. And so that's why we're introducing this uh, early on. So we have our noise working, and that's fantastic. So now let's move on to our first oscillator, which is going to be a sine wave. So if you can remember your trigonometry from school, you're going to be uh, well set up to, to follow along with this. So we're going to make a uh, sine oscillator, and it's going to take a starting phase, and it's going to take an amplitude and a frequency. And then what we want to do is we want to increment uh, the phrase. So we're the phase, not the phrase, the phase. So we're going to increment the phase, and of course we're going to want our good old 2 pi, okay? But we don't want to keep on typing 2 pi all day, so <laughs> we'll just put 2 pi in there. And it's going to be uh, 2 pi times uh, the frequency. Of course, this is Lisp, so uh, prefix notation, so this multiplication is going to go through. And then this is the sample rate. Now, we didn't mention this, so this is 44,100. Now, what this means is that that DSP function that you had a look at before, that's essentially a sync for all of our sound. And what's happening underneath the scenes is that the device driver of the audio card is calling that function 44,100 times a second to grab a value to push to the card, which is then going to turn it into an analog signal to push to the speaker. And then, of course, the speaker is actually just a reflection of that analog signal that's coming through. Um, sends pulses out, uh, and then you hear it in your ears. Um, also, we're going to just change this to uh, F as well, just to make my life a bit easier. Now, the final thing we need to do here is we also need to uh, mod this by 2pi. And then we're almost home. We're again going to use amplitude so we can control how strong this is. And we're going to use this with our sign. We compile this in. And now we can have uh, O1, which will be our first oscillator. Pride of pride. 
pride of place. Now, there's going to be one problem here, but I'll, I'll show you that in a second. So we'll start off, we're going to use our oscillator, we're going to give it a, a level, a gain, and then a frequency. So this is going to be 220 hertz, but it's actually not, but it actually is, but it actually, anyway. So we'll compile this in. Sorry about that. We'll compile this in. Um, now, the problem here actually is that it's actually running uh, twice as fast as it should. And the reason why is because as well as having the time, which is this 44,100 samples a second, we also have a channel because we're working in stereo. So we have left and right. So actually we have 88,200 samples a second that we need to generate. So what we actually need to do is we just need to take care of the channel. So we're going to say, if this is coming in on the left channel, then we are going to set an output Oh, now the screen's too big. And we're going to set the output to our oscillator. And then here, and in fact, I might even just add a gain in here as well, and then we can use the out. Now, effectively, what we're doing here is we're only going to calculate a result from the left channel, but then we're going to send it out both the left and right, right channels so we can have it coming out uh, our stereo speakers. And we're almost good to go. I just need to have a little bit of gain there and a little bit of gain here, and we should be good. We don't need that. Now it's a little too soft. Actually, so one of the things we can do here too is we can go DSP5, uh, gain 0.2. And that's allowing us to access the closed over value um, in this uh, DSP function. Make it even a bit louder. Now, because we abstracted out our oscillator, we can have as many of these oscillators as we want. We don't want to just have one. We want thousands and thousands of oscillators, clearly. Maybe not. But, uh, and we can use those oscillators in a variety of different ways. So we could, for example, just mix two oscillators together. So let me just add this first oscillator, and we'll add, uh, we'll add in a second one, O2, but we'll change the frequency of this second oscillator. Uh, it's gone, so let me change it here. So now you can hear the, uh, the two oscillators, and this plus that we're summing these two signals together which is essentially mixing these two signals together. Now, if we also had a multiplication ahead of those, we could also then change the scale of them, which then would be completely like a mixer, because then we could alter the, uh, the amount of volume for each of these as we go through. But as well as being able to mix these things together, of course, we can use one to control elements of the other, okay? So at this time, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna say, let's make this one 220 again but we're going to add, let's say, uh, 10 hertz. Uh, let's make it a bit quicker than that. So now what we're doing is we're doing a frequency modulation. We're actually going to modulate the frequency of the first oscillator with the output of the second oscillator. So let me uh, compile this one in for you. Okay, you can hear that frequency modulation now. This is FM. When we talk about FM, we're talking about frequency modulation. We can do exactly the same with amplitude, of course. We can have amplitude modulation. Things get, you know, more interesting if you, like we can make this uh, much wider, of course. All right. We can certainly speed things up. Okay. We can speed things up a lot. And then what starts happening is you actually start getting timbral effects. It stops moving from something you're sort of hearing as wobbling and it starts actually taking on a sound of its own or a, a kind of a timbre of its own. Uh, I'm just going to drop this back and we'll go back to where we were uh, just a second ago. Okay. Wrong one. Uh, let me do it down here. Okay. Now, I've made some covers for you today. <laughs> um, these, are, these are covers, not reproductions, okay? Um, and I'm, I'm introducing them because, for a few reasons, I mean, one of the things is because we're building this synthesizer up slowly, bit by bit, 
it, it's kind of one of those problems of, you know, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So it's going to be difficult for you to get a full picture about what's going on. So the covers are going to be showing you kind of the finished product uh, doing something, and, I'll, and, and I'm using them for little demonstrators. So I'm going to start uh, this little chap here. And uh, we'll just select everything. Uh, you don't really need to see the code here. Uh, it's, uh, it's not that exciting. Um, uh, let's select everything again. Um, and what I want you to listen for here is that this instrument that you're about to listen to, some of you probably are already guessing it from the title, um, but this is going to be an organ sound. It's supposed to sound a bit like a Hammond organ. And the thing I really want you to kind of just think about is that this is just essentially using three oscillate, uh, three sine waves um, in octave and then a fifth. And of course, the amounts of all of those are sort of tuned, but that's essentially what's uh, going on. So let's have a listen. So that's those three sine waves, and they're what we're combining together then to form that sound that you're listening to there. So if we head back, uh, we need to uh, add a couple more oscillators. So the next one we're going to introduce is a triangle wave. Now, I, I should just quickly say, one of the interesting things about the sine wave is it's the only, it's the only sound you'll ever hear that is only one frequency. All other sounds that you will ever hear are going to be made up of a multitude of frequencies that all have just various levels. Um, so the sine wave is quite particular. So the triangle wave is interesting because it's made up of odd harmonics. So it's going to give you a particular sound and they drop off very quickly. So it's quite a soft and mellow sound, much like a sine wave. How do we make a triangle? Ta-da! Isn't that cool, hey? So uh, it, it's simply just arc sine of sine. And uh, we can compile this uh, for our triangle. And I can introduce the uh, triangle in here as yet another uh, oscillator. Let me do this. Uh, make it number three, and it's a try. Let's compile this one in. And we're still on our sine wave. Let me switch over to the, to the triangle now. OK. Sine wave. And we could play this game all day. OK, so that's our triangle. And you can hear it's a little more harmonically rich than just the sine wave by itself. So next one we're going to have a look at is a square wave. And square wave is uh, another super simple thing to do. Although if there are any engineers in the audience, um, who here is an engineer? Yeah, there's plenty of engineers in the audience. This is a cheaty square wave, uh, so we're going to be aliasing all over the place, but our goal here today is simplicity, so just bear with me on that. So our square wave is going to simply be sine greater than 0, 1, oh, this is negative 1. Job's done. Now we have a square wave, OK? Yes, aliasing, I know. Um, it, it, Usually, we would want to band limit these uh, oscillators, but we're not going to worry about it today. So we're going to introduce the square wave, and then I'm going to give you a listen to the square wave. O4, and compile it in. Oops. Um, Extempore is uh, polymorphic, so uh, this is the reason it, it, it's type inferencing, and before, because there was no indication of a float anywhere, it's going to jump uh, to a double, but that's okay. We've just sorted that out. So 05 square osc, and we're going to specify a float here. He says, let me 
do this. Hmm. Using the wrong one. Thank you for the 04. <laughs> Jumping ahead. Okay, good. So now down here, we're going to introduce our square wave, which is going to be 05 down here. Just to have a quick listen to that. And the square wave is also just odd harmonics, but it doesn't decrease them quite as quickly. So the square wave, you'll get more of those harmonics in the sound, so it's an even richer sound. Okay, so let me shut that off quickly. And I'm going to give you uh, our second cover today. Uh, and this is just a good indication of square waves. So in the last sound, we had the organy sound, and that sounded was an indication of the sine waves. Now we're going to have a look at uh, square waves. So let's have a little square wave example here. And we're going to start with a classic square wave bass sound. And then we're going to add a square wave uh, lead sound. <laughs> now, that square lead actually also has a sine wave down the bottom. Uh, it's got two octaves under, and it's the thing that's warbling, and the square wave is just sitting on top. Okay, there's our square wave. Now we've got one more waveform, which is a saw wave. And saw wave's also fairly easy. We'll just grab our sign here. Copy it down. And we're just going to use modulo, because a saw wave is basically just up, drop, up, drop, up, drop. But the trick here is that we still need it to be uh, bipolar. So we need it to go from negative 1 to uh, 1. So here we go. Divide by pi. And then we add negative 1. And we have a saw. Add our saw in down here. Let's make this one uh, 6. Have a listen to it. Saw wave, beautiful, right? Absolutely beautiful. Now, the other thing I should say is it's not actually a saw, it's a ramp. But a saw and a ramp are opposites, and sonically you can't actually hear the difference between them. So, but one thing I do want to show with this little example is what happens when we take two saw waves. So we're going to have an 07 in a second. OK. Seven. Okay, so we've got our 07. I'm going to bring this in. I'll just turn the volume down a touch. So these are both playing at exactly the same frequency. Okay, now an interesting thing happens when we subtly change the frequencies. Okay, we go from this really harsh sound to a much more interesting sound, and this is because these are two slightly out of phase oscillators, which are then giving us that sort of more rich harmonic sound. Um, it's interesting then when you start to push it too far, you start hearing it as being out of tune. That's not so pleasant anymore. So it's this subtle balance of, of having enough uh, out of tune without pushing it too far. Okay, now um, we do have a little example of that one, which again is a sort of a classic case. So let me just give you a quick saw of the Vangelis lead. Am 
once we turn it on to go. Now, usually you're used to hearing that with a massive orchestral chord underneath it, so it sounds a bit funny sitting by itself, but uh, that's a, a classic example of a saw wave. So that's it for our raw materials. So in effect, we've now built our blocks of marble, but what we haven't started working on yet is chisels. Now, the sort of most uh, sort of immediate chisel is if we just, for example, use a square wave, so our square, what's that? 05. So I'm going to set amplitude to be the square 05, um, 05. And let's put it at speed. So let me just add speed here. We'll make it 1 hertz. And what we're trying to do here is we're then going to use that to control the amplitude of our output. So, okay, so now for the first time we're actually kind of hearing individual bits, like we've hacked off a great big corner of the, of the marble. But it's a bit brutal, right, because it's a square wave, it's all on or all off. So we actually want some subtlety coming in here. So we're going to introduce uh, an envelope so that we get some attack and release to this sound so that it's not just on or off all the time. And uh, we can do that by making an envelope. So here's our envelope and it's going to take a starting amplitude. It's going to take a gate. Now the gate is actually going to be the square wave. So when the square wave is high, we're going to be in the attack and sustain portion of the sound, and then when the swear wave goes low, we're going to get a release tailing off the end of the sound. So let's give us an attack and a release. And this is just going to be the gate, and what we're looking for is when it goes high. And if it goes high, we're going to increment uh, amp by some amount, and that's going to be uh, the attack by the sample rate, and it's going to be 1 over. And we're basically done, okay? The only slight change we need is that we also need to clamp it. So we're going to say that it has to always between 0 and 1. And then we copy this, and we introduce the release, and minus. So now we're going to go up, and then it's going to sit along with the gate until the gate drops, and then we're going to get a drop of release of the sound. So this is going to give some shape to our uh, blocky sound that we had before. So uh, then all we're doing is returning amp. So this is our envelope, and then we can use it down here. So we can set the amp to be envelope. We've already got our gate because we set that up before, and then we just need attack and release for our envelope. Add these up here, let's say 0.1, and release, and we should be good to go. We need to actually make our envelope. And here we've lost those blocky starts now. Let me sort of introduce them back in because we have attack and release. So if I set attack to zero, and I set release to zero. Now let's just introduce attack. And just release. And a little of both. Okay. So for our last cover, um, we're going to show you an example of sort of how these get applied uh, stage by stage. So we're going to start with our riff. This is really short attack and decay on the envelope.
and then the baseline is going to be slightly longer. And then lead is going to have a very long attack and decay. Okay, so there's an example of these envelopes being used in a whole bunch of uh, different contexts. So very short, medium length, and then long. And so now we're getting close to, we've done half of our uh, chisels. We actually also want a frequency chisel. So we need to make a filter. And we're gonna use a, a very simple one pole filter, which is a, uh, a feedback filter. So it's gonna take a, a Y and it's gonna take an X and we're going to set the y, it's a difference uh, equation. So we're going to multiply uh, x by a coefficient and we're going to add it to a multiplication of y by the same coefficient. We're going to add this uh, g coefficient in here. And that's it, believe it or not, this is our feedback filter. So let me uh, compile this one in and, whoops, let's do the same here filter and uh, we're going to need like F1 for filter and then we can add this to our sound down here. F1 output and we're going to start with it at zero. I'm also just going to change this and call it cutoff frequency zero. So when we compile this in we're not going to hear anything change immediately but then we're going to hear the change as we introduce it over time. if we actually use it. Let's start that again. And in fact, if we go to all the way to one, you won't actually hear any sound at all. So this is like playing with the EQ on your stereo, stereo at home. Um, one thing we'd like to do though is we'd really like to be able to play with this uh, uh, using um, frequencies rather than this 0 to 1. So we can actually do a bit of a, a cheat for that. Um, And now it's basically the same as before, but our cutoff we can actually use uh, more sort of realistic values. So that's a, a thousand hertz. We could make it 5,000 hertz, 10,000 hertz. You can hear it's getting brighter. If we go back down the other way, uh, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, etc. Okay, so now we've introduced our second chisel, so we're all done with chisels. The last thing we need to do now is we need some way of actually playing notes on this thing. Okay, so up to this point we've got our raw sounds, we've got our chisels, now we need some way of actually being able to play a note. So I'm going to introduce a, a sequencer module here. I'm not going to uh, bother typing this one uh, in, so we'll just paste it in, it's a bit too long. <laughs> it's not super long, but it's, you know, a little too long to type. Um, and then we'll introduce the sequencer. The other tricky thing I've done here is to sneakily put this uh, array of frequencies in and um, you'll see why in just a sec. So we're actually using the sequencer, what it's actually going to do is it's always going to return both a frequency and a gate to us. So we need to grab out the gate and we need to grab out the frequency and we can use those as we've been using gate and, and, and frequency so far. So let's set uh, the output to be uh, our sequencer and it needs to take a channel and it uh, needs to take a width and it needs to take a speed. And then what we can do is we can set a frequency which is going to be the tuples, oops, second 
and a gate, tuple's first element. Let me add these in, gate and frequency. And then we just ap apply them where we need them. So our envelope now is no longer going to be the square, it's going to be our gate. And then here's going to be frequency. And here's also going to be frequency, but we still want our sort of subtle out of tunedliness. So I'm going to uh, just add in a little bit of out of tunedliness. <laughs> Anyone pick that? No? It's the Stranger Things. Now what happens if we increase the speed here? Oh, now you all know what it is, right? I didn't hear anyone speaking up before. So we're getting there, there's one item that's still missing and of course it's one of the biggest items is that at the moment there's absolutely no reverberation on this sound, it's just incredibly dry which is part of why it sounds like it does. Now reverberation remember is in the context of this room for example when I speak or when the speakers speak for me that sound is moving out into the space and it's, you're hearing me directly a little bit from me and a lot from the speakers, but you're also hearing me from every wall in the room, every chandelier, it's just bouncing all over the place. And what those are are just reflections of the sound, but of course those reflections all take different amounts of time to reach your ears. And that's effectively what reverberation is. Now we're gonna do a bit of a cheat for our reverb today, we're just gonna use a delay. So let me uh, introduce, I mean a reverb is in part just a delay, but uh, usually it's a, a more sophisticated combination of delay elements. We're just gonna use a stereo delay here today. So I'm gonna introduce a delay. The delay needs to take a length and we're going to fill a buffer. And this is how we make our delay. We're gonna push things into the buffer and then we're gonna take them out of the buffer with a couple of small sort of uh, variations on that. We're gonna need an output. We're also gonna need a position because we need a playhead effectively to circle around the buffer. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna get, uh, oops, we also need uh, an input. We need some data coming into our delay. So we're gonna set the uh, output to be the uh, position in the buffer, so that's all good. And then we want to set into the buffer the new input. So we're going to set it at position and it's gonna be the input and it's also, we're gonna also want to add some of the output. So we're going to use a scaled version of the output, which is going to be our feedback. And then on top of those, we're going to then need to increment position and making sure to modulate by the length because this is circular buffer. So we want it going around to the end and then back around to the start again. And we're basically all there. So now we're just gonna output the input plus we're gonna output some sort of mixed amount of the delay. And uh, we compile this. And we're all good. Okay, so now in our main, we're actually for the first time gonna use stereo. So we're gonna use left and right. Up until this point, we've been sending everything the same out of both speakers. But this is the first time we're actually gonna have something different happening in the left speaker to the right speaker. So we're gonna have a delay here, and I'm gonna make it delay left, delay right. And these are different lengths. So we're gonna get sort of ping-ponging happening between the two delays. And then all the way down here, we're gonna check our channel. And delay left is gonna be gain out. Uh, and what do we need? We need mix and feedback. And D right, gain out, mix and feedback. And I think that's the right number of braces. Can't see anything. Cannot find mix, fair enough, we haven't added it. So we're gonna start it at zero and feedback zero for the moment. Uh, 
interesting. Well, that's just silly, isn't it? There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so equals channel zero is going to be uh, left or, or right. I'm not actually sure that we've got this uh, plugged in the right way around. But uh... now, at the moment, the mix and the feedback are set to zero. So let's just slowly kind of increase those. Actually, feedback, I'm going to set it high just to start with, but you won't hear anything until we bring some of the mix in. So here's mix. Can you hear that as it's slowly coming in now? Now, of course, if we do the, uh, the speed up, so... Stranger things in hundred lines of code, a couple of hundred lines of code probably by now. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, um, one of the things I really want to convey is that, in actual fact, there's a lot here in not much. Like, you can actually go away and take this, and you'd be able to explore an awful lot of things just with the code that's that's here. Um, and there's some real kind of interesting application of basically using code as a way to explore new ideas, right? So if you take this little bit, and we often don't talk about this enough, but if you're interested in exploring sound, code is an extraordinarily powerful way of doing that. So even for teaching purposes, being able to take kids and actually walk them through all of these steps one by one so that they can actually see how these things are really constructed, I think is a very powerful idea. So now that we've got our uh, sort of synthesizer all built, I think we should uh, finish off by uh, doing something with our synthesizer. So how am I for time? Just out of time? A little bit of time. Let's do a super quick little play with our synthesizer before we finish today. So um, how about we, uh, look, we're going to go for some classic 80s cheese here just to stay with our uh, Stranger Things theme. So let's go for a, uh, a pad sound. Okay, let's turn this down a little bit. Oh, actually, I'm also going to just change our sounds. It's using the last. It's using the last demo I did. Let's do that. And where were we? Okay, here's our pad sound. Now, cheesy 80s music needs a pad. It also absolutely needs an arpeggiator, okay? So we're gonna add, add an arpeggiator in here. Uh, let's see, what do we need? We're, we're gonna go super simple here, so... Um, oops. 67, 62. Okay, we've got our arpeggiator. We're gonna stick it on a, a second sound here. Okay, now we definitely need a drum kit. Now we haven't talked about drum kits, but this monster synthesizer we've built is also very capable uh, of being a drum kit. So uh, in fact, sine waves make wonderful kick drums. So uh, let's go uh, K1 for kick drum. Um, we're gonna have, uh, let's, let's keep it simple. And make this kit. That is a sine wave, believe it or not. It's actually a sine wave where the frequency is just ripped out. There's no filter there. It's just dropping the frequency of the sine wave incredibly quickly. 
Uh, we could also add some hi-hats, which we're going to use. And these hi-hats are made by white noise, basically. They're filtered white noise. So let's have a, have a go with some uh, hi-hats. Okay, so here come our uh, hi-hats. We're going to need this on the kit as well. So the difference between these hi-hats is actually just the random jumbling of the 36s and the 48s. So one's an open hi-hat and the others are closed. But again, this is actually just built from white noise, basically. Um, and let's finish with some chintzy melody, shall we? A little bit of... Uh, Full chintz. Oh, lovely. It's under control, it's under control. It's bringing back 80s memories for you all. But I think we are well and truly out of time. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this uh, synthesizer creation madness. Uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>